Good evening. Good evening and welcome to City Council's town hall meeting. This is the first one that uh, I can remember in my memory, uh, and I've lived in York for more than 40 years. Uh, I'm very pleased to see folks here, and we hope that this is a, an instructive time, and uh, we look forward to your thoughtful questions and uh, comments on uh, what you'd like to see in York City and what uh, you aren't so pleased about. But I hope that when we're all finished with this uh, at the end of the evening, that you walk away having a better understanding of what council can do and what council is unable to do and what the uh, role of the administration is alongside council and also that you truly believe when you leave here that Council is making every effort to be as transparent as possible. So I want to first off thank Logos Academy for uh, hosting this event for us. They're a wonderful community partner and uh, we thank them and um, um, are delighted to be here. Uh, I can't see the uh, PowerPoints, but our very capable Diana Thompson Mitchell, city clerk, will be scrolling through and hopefully uh, she'll be able to, uh, to follow our conversations and, uh, and give you the necessary uh, visuals. Also, on the piano up front are some index cards and pencils and we encourage you to write as legibly as possible um, your questions and we'll hand them to uh, Diana and she will then read those uh, questions to us. Um, this is so that everyone will have an opportunity to ask questions um, and that we not take up a great deal of time in uh, questions that are more statements than they are questions. So. Uh, Please, at any time, feel free to come up here and uh, pick up a, uh, an index card and a pencil and write down your question. We'll pass them along to, uh, to Diana. Um, we should have on the screens the mission of the uh, city council and of the city. Um, I won't go ahead and read it, but I, I will want to say to you that um, city charter was adopted in 1962, and uh, it is, in simple terms, a strong mayor form of government. That is to say that council is a legislative branch, the mayor, the executive branch, um, but the mayor actually controls all the actions um, in terms of enforcement of any of the laws and resolutions that are adopted by council along with a whole bunch of other uh, uh, initiatives and, and uh, roles that they play. But the important thing to remember is that council does pass legislation and it also passes the budget, which is probably the, the biggest power that council has, and that is over the budget. Um, we can eliminate, we can add, depending on how many votes it takes and whether those, those votes uh, will pass it. But um, that is really the, the hold that we have, or I should say the balance that we have on the uh, executive branch. Um, you can see in the organizational chart that we are uh, independent of the mayor, just as the treasurer and the controller is. We have city council and we have one employee. We do not uh, oversee any of the employees uh, of the city of, of York uh, except for the um, city clerk and any others that we might hire. Um, I think it's useful to look at this to see exactly where the different, um, where the organization is split up and how that moves along in terms of uh, city government. I'll now turn this over to 
Uh, well, let me explain one more thing. As you see us here, we established this seating order and voting order at the very beginning of the year. And um, I just thought that it would be good to mention that. And we will uh, hear from Ms. Washington first, since she would be the one that usually votes first. And we'll go right on down through the line as we vote in council. So Ms. Washington, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Nixon. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to share a little bit about well, why was some of the reasons that I chose um, to seek appointment uh, for New York City Council. I have a few here, and one of the main things is that I truly love my community well beyond a social media hashtag. I'm born and raised here, and I want nothing more than to see everyone and all members of our community succeed. I want to ensure that our city is fiscally sound and forward thinking while providing adequate housing, employment, and quality resources to all of our residents. A little bit about me is that I'm a mom, I'm also a, a member of clergy, I'm a small business owner, and I'm an avid servant to our community. I have over a decade of experience in both local government and state government. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in criminal justice, as well as a master's degree in human services and I enjoy listening to others and helping others in any way that I can. Thank you. Good evening. I am Judy Ritter Dixon. I am a native Yorker. I am a graduate of William Penn Senior High School, so I am a Bearcat. Go Bearcats. I graduated from Penn State York, and I have two degrees from Penn State. Um, one is a Bachelor of Science, and the other is Letters, Arts, and Science, and then my Master's is from Lincoln University. I'm a certified paralegal and an ordained minister, and I'm also retired. I am a mother, a wife, and a grandma, and I enjoy York. I actually live in the house that I was raised in. That's how much I appreciate York, because it's right in the 500 block of South Duke Street, down from the Christmas Attics, and I love my community, and I want to see it flourish and grow. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Mike Buckingham, and uh, I'm a, lo a lifelong city resident as well. Uh, I went to the other high school in York, though, unfortunately. York Catholic, not York High. But I have two, <laughs> two boys that uh, were brought up in the city schools and got a great education there. So uh, my wife and I both appreciate that very much. Uh, I'm a retired CPA, and I've had several careers uh, in my adult life, both in accounting and in retail. Uh, I spent 20 years on the City Planning Commission. And uh, since I'm retired and I have some extra time, I just thought it'd be a good thing to give something back to the city. And hopefully, uh, I can do that on council. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out. My name is Sandy Walker. Uh, this is my third year on York City Council for um, my first term. Um, I consider myself to be a York City native. My family moved here when I was about eight months old, and I've been here pretty much ever since, with the exception of going off to college. Graduated from William Penn Senior High School, also known as the High, in 2001, went off to the University of Richmond. I graduated from the University of Richmond um, on a full athletic scholarship. Uh, in 2005, double majored in leadership studies, urban policy, and I have a minor in business administration and I always knew that I would come back to the city of York. Um, coming back to the city of York, I worked actually worked for the city of York for um, a little under six years. I was the youth program coordinator for the city of York. Uh, my passion is uh, definitely, one of my passions is definitely working with our young people in our city. And um, I had a great time being the coordinator for the city of York when it came to youth programs. During that time, I coached basketball um, up at the high school. I coached at the junior high school level and then coached our girls basketball team at the varsity level. It was a great experience. And then after I left the coaching field, in a sense, I still started a feeder program, but I served on uh, the school board for the school district of the city of York. And that was a four-year term, but um, another member resigned. And so I fulfilled the remaining two years of their term. So I served on the school board for six years. And then after that, I decided to run for city council. And 
that puts me into my third year. Um, got elected and it's been a great um, time serving with my fellow council members. Um, the reason why I decided to run for city council was uh, because, one, I have a strong passion and I'm dedicated to making sure that I can be the median between our residents and legislation, administration, when it comes to um, the operation of the city of York. Uh, coming from a gr more of a grassroots level, it's difficult on a political level to get things done that you want to get done, but the encouraging part is that when you start to see some things happening or some things changing, you know that you're making a difference. So it's been a great ride for these three years. I'm looking forward to my last year um, and continuing to work towards uh, making York City a better place to live, work, and play in. So thank you guys for coming out tonight. Well, I'm Henry Nixon. I think you probably all know that. Uh, I've lived here. I moved here in uh, 1970 uh, from not too far away from Gettysburg. And I've lived in the city ever since. We've lived in uh, the house that we now occupy for the last 40 years and um, brought up our three children uh, right there by uh, Farquhar Park on North Newberry Street. And uh, they all went to York City Schools, graduated and went off in their lives. And um, I'm pleased to report that they're, they're all doing very well. Um, I currently am a grandfather of six, and uh, four of them is what I call homemade. We have uh, two grandchildren from our foster son and his wife. I ran for city council because I saw the deterioration of our neighborhood, and it was very frustrating for me. Uh, it was at one time when we bought our house, uh, almost entirely owner-occupied on that block. Um, and that changed gradually, and I saw the, uh, the results of uh, tenant-occupied properties where they simply didn't uh, have the same kind of care that one does when you have a solid investment. Um, so I, I ran because I wanted to try to, to change the attitude of the city in terms of uh, keeping nice, clean neighborhoods um, and in encouraging home ownership. Um, it's, it's a tough one because government works so slowly. That has been my single biggest frustration. Um, and I don't know how to speed it up. I don't know that one can. It's just the way it works. But hopefully, with the Neighborhood Improvement Ordinance and some things, we're going to tweak that over the course of this coming year, and some other things that we can make uh, York City a better place to live. Um, so I encourage input on how we can make that happen. Um, and uh, we've got uh, on the piano the, all of our names, our contact information, so please uh, pick one up and uh, be in touch. So thank you. Ed Quina. I will share a bit about what our role is as York City Council. As you see, there are five members of York City Council who are elected at large, with each council member serving a four-year term with terms of expiration structured to end on a staggering basis. At large means that there is not one member of council assigned to a certain section of the city. Each council member equally shares in the legislative duties for the city of York and its residents. Council is a legislative branch of the city government as well as its policy making body. As council, we look to the city's goals and major projects and infrastructure improvements ranging from community growth to land use to finances and strategic planning as the basis of our legislation. The city charter and third class city code are the driving documents behind what the council can and can't do. These documents outline the scope of what local government does as a whole, including its rules and responsibilities to its citizen, citizenry and defines what powers the council has. In essence, council does its very best to represent 
our constituents only after we've seen to the needs of the city as a whole. The legislative authority of the city is vested in and exercised by the elected council. City councils may not perform any executive or administrative function unless specifically authorized by statute. statute. For instance, council members may not supervise the day-to-day -day operations of city government or exercise supervisory authority over city employees. Although the city council and individual council members may not supervise city employees who are under the executive authority of the mayor, the council may have its own employees. These employees may be supervised as determined by council. The mayor, on the other hand, has the power to hire and supervise all other city employees except for employees of council, the treasurer, and the controller. Thank you. I am going to share with you, and I have a long list of the council's power and duties. Some of the powers and duties of the city council include, we establish long and short term objectives and priorities for the city, such as the city's strategic comprehensive plan and its long term financial plan. We enter into contracts for services and projects professional service agreements such as consultants and actuary companies, trash collection, street improvements, etc. We borrow funds, parking authority for the general authority, tax and revenue, anticipation note, and etc. Regulate and use regulate land use through zoning laws. We regulate business activity through licensing and regulations. We exercise the power of eminent domain. We regulate and approve land development. We oversee economic development for the city. We approve funding for projects and programs for residents, community development block land, Elm Street project, and street improvement projects. We respond to constituents, legislative concerns and needs, like chickens, you know, when people were complaining about, can we have chickens in the city? <coughs> Trash, noise, snow <coughs> removal, keeping of animals and property maintenance. We enact all codes, rules, and regulations for the general public's health, safety, and welfare. We provide sufficient revenues to operate city government through the adoption of the annual budget and by levying all taxes and establishing all fees and charges for city services. We establish the compensation to be paid to all elected and appointed officers of the city. We may investigate activities of city government when an egregious wrongdoing has occurred, such as theft of city funds or misuse of taxpayer dollars, not for executive branch matters, such as citizens' concerns over receiving parking tickets or general complaints about a city employee. We may override mayoral vetoes by the affirmation, affirmative vote of four members of council. We may appoint a new mayor or council member if a vacancy occurs in the office. We also confirm appointments to various boards and authorities. Thank you. Mr. Buckingham. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, meeting schedule of council. Uh, all regular meetings of city council are held in council chambers at 101 South George Street on the first and third Tuesday evening of each month at 6 p.m. Except when such Tuesday is a legal holiday observed by the city government, summer recess, or when the general and or primary elections fall on such Thursday, then the regular meeting will be held on the following day. Uh, the public comment session uh, always starts the two legislative council sessions. 
Prior to the start of the council legislative session, general public comment is received. During this session, members of the public may discuss items not on the legislative agenda. Each member is given five minutes to speak, but that time may be shortened depending on the number of people waiting to speak. An important distinction about council's general public comment session is that the public comment session is not a town hall meeting. The idea and intent of the general public comment session is to receive feedback from the public on legislative matters affecting the community. This could include ideas for new legislation, how to improve legislation, or to let council know about legislation that is not working or is not being enforced. Comment outside of legislation generally is outside of council's purview and should instead be taken up with the mayor and or his directors. Also, the five minutes given to speak is not a punishment. It's merely a mechanism per, put into place to maintain order. The five minute rule has been in effect for over a decade, but has been uh, fairly loosely enforced, and that is not fair to the process. Regardless, if there is one person wishing to address council or 10 people wishing to address council, the five minute time limit will be strictly enforced going forward. The public comment session is not the only way to contact council. You are not just limited to the five minutes allotted during this period. You may share your thoughts and ideas by sending us an email, calling us, or submitting a statement or idea to us in writing. We never want you to feel that the public comment session is your only means to be heard by council. Next is the council committee meetings. The council committee meetings are held in council chambers at 6 p.m. on the fourth Wednesday of each month, unless there is another date advertised. No, uh, no committee meetings are held during the summer months of June, July, and August, or in the month of December. Council has seven committees, police, fire, public works, economic and community development, business administration, rules and administrative code, and general. Each committee is responsible for the resolutions, the bills, and other actions that will come before council during a regular or special meeting. The committee meetings were established to give council a platform to debate and discuss in depth legislation or actions that will come before us prior to council's action, thereby allowing the legislative sessions primarily for voting on issues. Thank you. And I am going to just address some of the things that um, we've tried to work on while um, I've been on council and especially this year. For those of you who um, pay attention and are involved, at the beginning of the year we did uh, have, we had a press conference in regards to some of the initiatives that we are taking on throughout this year. Um, one of them, and especially the hot topic of economic development, um, we definitely are trying to look at our priorities for our capital needs assessment when it comes to certain projects. We also are looking at revamping our ordinance when it comes to uh, minority-owned businesses. We call it in the ordinance, it's more of addressing uh, disadvantaged and small businesses. But we want to make sure our citizens and our community are being able to get a fair chance when it comes to the projects that go on throughout the city. Um, a lot of times when you drive around and you see the construction that's going on, the, the work that's being done on our streets, it can become very discouraging when you see folks that don't look like the people that are the makeup in our community. So in my opinion, a lot of times that money is not staying in our community and not benefiting our citizens. So we definitely are trying our best um, to work with administration so that we can revamp that ordinance so that people in our community are getting a fair shot at some of these construction projects that are going on so that that money helps us out on an economic level. Um, one of the other things, if you um, didn't know, um, Councilwoman Washington uh, introduced a safe time policy for our employees and we adopted that not too long ago. And that deals with um, anyone who might be in some type of domestic situation. They're not gonna be penalized for taking time off to deal with that situation. 
And we think that's very important because um, we're one of the few throughout Pennsylvania, um, municipalities throughout Pennsylvania that adopted that policy. And we just want to make sure that our employees know that we support them as much as we can. One of the things um, I think that can become a little frustrating with being on city council is that a lot of times folks don't really know what our roles are and that's why we decided to have the town hall. A lot of things that happen, we can forward to administration, but of course, as we stated earlier in the meeting, uh, we don't have any employees except for our city clerk. So when we get emails, when you come to city council meetings, we make sure that we do our best to address the issues by forwarding them or communicating them with administration. Um, that is the realm that we can deal with it and then we can follow up to see if anything's been done. But a lot of times we often have to tell folks like, we appreciate your reaching out to us and that's what we're here for. And once we forward it to administration, we hope that it's acted on a lot faster. But when it comes to our city council meetings, we would love more participation. Um, over the past couple months, there has been more public comment, more public input, and we enjoy that um, because sometimes our meetings can last five minutes. If no citizens show up, there's no public comment. Um, also, in addition to that, when our citizens decide to come out to meetings, it reinforces the issues that you may have. So a lot of times, if you're telling us, if you, if you see us walking down the street, you say, hey, Sandy, I have this going on on my block. I can forward that concern to administration, but if you come to a city council meeting, it's heard in a public setting. So it's not just us forwarding it to administration. And it reinforces, and most of the time, 99% of the time, you're not the only person dealing with that issue. So we appreciate um, when you come out. Uh, one of the things that we most likely will be looking and to work on is the firework legislation ordinances in our city. There were a lot of complaints when it came to that um, after July 4th and throughout the entire summer. So um, that's something that we definitely are looking into. We've gotten emails, we've gotten phone calls, people have seen us on the street and told us about that. So we definitely, it has not fallen on deaf ears. We're going to continue to look to see what legislation or ordinances we can um, uh, put forward to address that. A lot of times what we do and why it takes so long is because we work with our solicitor. So if there's a complaint or you ask us to put through an ordinance, we work with our solicitor and they have to research to see what is available what other municipalities are doing, what we can do as a third class city according to code. So it takes a while, but we want you to know that it's not falling on deaf ears. If you give us a concern, if you wanna see some type of ordinance, we are pushing forward to try to address those things, but I know fireworks was a hot topic this summer, so we are uh, looking to address that. Um, one of the things we can boast about is no tax increase, but that doesn't change the fact that our taxes are still high. We're all city residents. We um, all are homeowners. So we understand. Um, we try our best to work hand in hand with the school district to have that open relationship. And um, we haven't raised taxes, but we know that the taxes are still a burden. So we try to do as much as possible to work with the administration so that we are not increasing costs when the budgets come before us. Speaking of that, that rolls over into our pensions. That's something that is completely out of our control when it comes to our police and our fire. Um, and that is not just affecting us, it affects every municipality throughout Pennsylvania. I have no clue of how that will be addressed. And um, I think whoever finds the answer to that will be one rich person. Um, but we know it's an issue. We know it's an issue. We would love to be able to hire more civil service, policemen, more firemen, but we just don't have the funds to do so. Um, when it comes to the hiring, because we are a third class city, it takes almost a year to bring on 
police officers. So for those of you who don't know, when those names come before us, we are just approving the initial process so that they can go towards the other steps to become a policeman or a fireman. And then most of the time, those names that we approve initially aren't the same folks, so there has to be a substitute list behind that. Um, so even when we have police officers that come before us, it takes a year, almost a year, just to go through that process. Um, one of the issues I know that I hear in our community is uh, when it comes to our police officer, our force, our makeup, is minorities. We don't have a lot of minority police officers, and I would love for our police department to be a representation of our community. We are trying, Chief Banker is trying, the administration is trying, um, the relationship with the school district, because I think sometimes the stigma when it comes to um, police is not the, the most positive. We work well with the York City School District, and if you're familiar with the York City School District, um, they have their own separate police department. And that wasn't just something that just came out of the blue. I was on the school board when we put that forward. We wanted to help our children build a better relationship and have a better perception of police, and it needed more of a community aspect towards that. And I think the York City School District has done a wonderful job with the folks that they continue to bring on to be police officers and to be the first images of what some of our kids may see and might have um, an influence of a better perception when it comes to the first thoughts that comes into our mind when it comes to police officers. Um, Chief Banker is doing a wonderful job. Chief Kelly has done a wonderful job. We know it's a concern and we want to see more police officers that are representative of the makeup of our community. So don't think that just because we're not saying it at every meeting that that's not a concern. Um, one of the other things is, uh, I believe at one of the mayor's first town halls that he had uh, at the beginning of the year, the sewer issue. And I'm pretty sure that might come up on one of the note cards. Um, administration is trying to work on efficient software, efficient collections, updating, and they have some initiatives that they're trying to put together so that you can get your sewer bills in a timely manner. Um, it takes a long time. So it's being worked on. When it's presented to us, you know, we will do our best to support whatever will move our city forward and help you out, help us all out, because we all receive the sewer bills and sometimes after the date that they are due. Um, so that's definitely something that we are um, continuing to, to work on. Um, all I can say is that, and we, I can speak for council, is to continue to come to meetings, continue to email us. If you go on the website, our phone numbers are on there, our email addresses are on there, and we are always around in the city. So feel free to come up to us, feel free to talk to us. We're always in open air. Thank you again for coming out. Thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll repeat that. If you want to ask questions, we're going to go into that portion of this meeting. There are uh, index cards over here and pencils. Please write down your question uh, as legibly as possible, and it'll be collected by our city clerk, Ms. Uh, Thompson Mitchell, and then she will read the questions to us. This is being done in an effort to have as many questions answered uh, during the time allotted. Uh, please feel free to direct the questions to one of us uh, if you see that uh, that makes sense for you for that question, or it can be an at-large question, which is also just fine. Uh, if everything's working the way it's supposed to, uh, Ms. Washington is monitoring Facebook. We're on Facebook Live. And the people from the community that were not able to be here this evening uh, may uh, ask some questions through through Facebook. Uh, we ask that all the questions that are being asked are from city residents. This is uh, a town hall for our citizenry, and we would like it limited to the folks that live in the city. 
At the, uh, at the end of the meeting, towards the end of the meeting, if time allows, uh, often when you have questions, you hear a question, you get the answer, uh, you say, well, what about, there's another question that comes up. We'll uh, hopefully have time for those kinds of follow-up questions where you all can come up to the podium and, uh, and address us uh, with those uh, follow-up questions. So at this point, Diana, if you'd like to begin, I think you have some cards and questions. Got a couple of questions, a little, little book here. Oh. I'm Diana Thompson Mitchell, I'm the city clerk. If any of you don't know me, I know quite a few of you, Joanne and Candy and everybody here. Hello, everyone. And council, I have a couple of questions for you. I'm gonna do the best that I can to read them, okay? So for those of you who are still filling out be kind. Be kind to the clerk. You're going to do these one at a time, aren't you? <laughs> no, I'm going to do them all at one time, and then you have to remember yeah. them all. I'm, I'm an aging man, and I can't remember <laughs> that long. Well, this should be a quick meeting then. All right, uh, so the first question is, we are facing an issue with uh, over mental health coverage in the area. There are several therapists in the area that are not renewing their medical uh, Medicare designation in the city, and recipients are limited to the ability to travel outside of the area to get their mental health uh, needs. Is there anything that the council can do to communicate this issue to the state? Do you want to take that? Um, I mean, I'm happy to try to, to, uh, to talk to uh, uh, Barb at the uh, uh, health health bureau, uh, and see what can be done. This is an issue that's throughout the United States, uh, and and it's a it's a real concern. There there isn't anything in particular that council can do in the way of legislation uh, for this particular issue, but maybe we can find out if there are some granting sources where we can, um, uh, that the Health Bureau is able to, uh, to offer more mental health uh, consultation and therapy for those folks that are not able to, to get out of the community. I'm not quite sure what um, First Family Health, whether they have a component of mental health issues uh, or not, but that might be something worth investigating for those folks, and they're located right downtown. There's parking available directly across the street, and um, and that should be something that hopefully they, they offer that. Thank you, Mr. President. The next question is about residency. Can we create a residency requirement for the police? And the second part of that was a question that was received earlier about uh, residency for employees. Uh, the issue for the residency with employees is that um, they were having uh, a problem hiring people uh, based on the residency. So that was a question that came earlier today, and I said that I would share that with you. Is there anything that council is considering about residency for your police or city employees? Do you want to take that? We had some conversation yeah. earlier. I did talk with the president of council about that because people have been approaching me about residency, but because of the arbitration that it has to go on, we cannot address it until January, right? We can't talk about it. I've heard the concerns and I understand the concerns, but we cannot discuss it until January, until after the arbitration is over. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, and let me just add to that, that um, by contract, the, uh, fi the firefighters and the police have been excused from the residency requirement. That was done some time ago, uh, just as the teachers uh, union is also is not required to live in the city. I've often said that if we had 100 policemen and 60 firefighters and a couple hundred teachers that all were required to live in the city, it would be transformational for us. But that barn door was opened many years ago, mm -hmm. and there's no way to close it. Thank you. Uh, Next I, question. Excuse me, I'd sorry. just like to add one thing. I think we'd all love to see all the fire, firemen and police and city employees 
city residents, uh, that's not practical for the reasons that have been mentioned. Uh, we, we have discussed about giving preferences, though, for, to uh, applicants that do live in the city, and that's, uh, that question is, hasn't been answered to this point, but I think we're all in favor of something like that that maybe would encourage um, more city residents to apply for positions. Would any of you, thank you, thank you. Anyone else would like to respond to that? Councilwoman Washington, Councilwoman Walker. And that's a bad question, but the first one. Okay. Actually, the first question about um, mental health coverage. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our uh, rep for our district is uh, Carol Hill Evans, and she was on city council. So whoever did send that message, if you want to email, you can email our city clerk, or you can email any of us. Um, our emails are on the website. Maybe we can follow up to see what actually exists in the city, and we can also follow up to see if there's any legislation in regards to mental health um, on the table. And Representative Hill Evans can update us more on that. Any other comment? Okay. Next question, how much control does the city have over the RDA, Downtown Inc., York County Economic Alliance, if any. Well, we RDA. RDA, Downtown Inc., and York County Economic Alliance. How much control do you have, if any, over those entities? Do you want? Okay. You were busy writing. I <laughs> well, with Downtown Inc. and YCEA, we don't have any control over them. Um, they're their own separate entities. Now, what I, I, I like what um, Kevin has done in regards to reaching out to us to keep us abreast of some of the changes that are going on with YCA. And if you didn't know, Downtown Inc. have they merged, mm -hmm. and Silas is now um, the Vice, Vice, president. Vice President of YCEA. So they've merged, but we don't have any control in regards to, to what they do. It's a separate entity. Um, with RDA, RDA has its own a board. Mm -hmm. um, there may be things that come to us, but we don't have actual control when it comes to RDA. So uh, maybe some other council members can talk a little bit more about the actual role of RDA, but we don't have control. We can't tell them what to do. Certain things may come to us for approval when it comes to exemptions for properties, um, when it comes to taxes, but control, we don't direct any of those organizations that were listed. I can just jump in and add that uh, Downtown Inc. is funded by uh, the city, and we've helped to, I mean, we approve that fund. Their budget is approximately 900000 a year, and we fund it by $10,000. So we, there's not a great deal of clout there. Uh, and uh, Economic Alliance, obviously, is a, uh, an entity all into its own that receives a, a pretty significant funding from the county government. The uh, RDA is an authority, and that's a quasi-government body so that the RDA uh, does not report to anyone. It is a uh, sole quasi-government authority. I might add there is a little bit of control in that the city does fund the RDA, so that item is in the budget every year, but which may or may, or may not be a significant amount of control. Depends on how much we're talking about. And City Council also appoints to members to the RDA and to Downtown Inc. Um, and there are two city staff that serve on the RDA board, uh, which is our Economic Development, Economic and Community Development Director, and the Deputy Director, and that's Shavosky, Buffalo, and Nicole Davis. Well, she got married, so I don't know what her new last name is. Any other comments to um, that? Uh, just to follow up on that, I mean, once again, we're in a, we're a situation where it's clearly the administration that oversees economic development. Uh, we approve budgets. Uh, we approve the, uh, the appointment of a director. And that's about it. Um, but the, again, it's a strong mayor form of government, and the mayor is the one 
that uh, has control over those employees, has control over basically what the mayor wants to do with any of these directors. Do you want to do that afterwards? Can, we'll can you save case. that until a little bit later and uh, we'll, we'll get to it? If you can just wait, we'll want to hand, uh, get to the other questions. Write it down real quick. Go ahead over there so you don't forget. <laughs> there you go. And we'll get to it. Okay, Miss Joanne has something for me here. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, any other comments on that question? Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Oh, you have one. Okay. Thank you. What happened there? Okay. Okay. All right, next question. Back in January, uh, the council had the opportunity to appoint, appoint a gay Latino who is passionate about his community, but council didn't do that. So they want to know what you have done to enhance the lives of the LGBTQ uh, uh, Q and Latina community. Is there anything that the council has done or supported? And if so, could you explain? Well, yeah, I don't, I can kind of touch on um, and help me out, Lou, if I have it wrong. Like Unidos, Lat Latino, Latino Unidos. Unidos. Um, some of us did attend their initial, um, and on the first Friday we attended their initial uh, event. And whenever there's um, things that they have in the community, some of us try to attend and be supportive of their efforts. And I do believe that they are doing a fine job in the New York City community, and we support them. I would just like to add that, in general, um, we support all members of our community, and we represent all members of our community. So I believe I can speak for all of us when I say that. Um, we try to make ourselves visible, we try to make ourselves available, and we try to do the best that we can do, as I said before, to represent all members of our community, regardless of whatever category that they represent, um, we represent them as well. Uh, I might add the city also does support the York City Human Relations Commission, which uh, their purview is handling um, com complaints about discrimination of any sort. And just, just to follow up, um, I agree with all my council members that, that said something. Um, you know, we represent all members of our community. In regards to legislation, uh, there hasn't been anything for city council, but if someone has something that they may want to forward to us, we're more than welcome to consider something, as, a, as I stated before, you know, it takes a process because we have to put it to, towards our solicitor. He has to research it, see what's going on in other municipalities, and then get back to us. Um, I did receive an email about conversion therapy. Um, so I do want to be clear about that. There was a citizen who sent me an email about con the conversion therapy, and I'm not going to go into detail about it. But if you um, look it up, there's some, it, it can be a serious thing. Um, so we are looking to see what might be able to be done in regards to that. Um, and that's not exactly focused on LGBT community um, or the Latino community that's focused on our community as a whole um, with some of our, uh, especially our young people that might be dealing with some issues that um, uh, they may not be in the most uh, safe environment. So I did receive an email in regards to that. But when it comes to legislation, um, I'm not familiar of some things that may have gone on in other municipalities, but we're more than open if there's, some e if there's something out there to email us um, that you feel might be necessary for New York City. Any other comments? Okay. And I would like to say that council did appoint, even though I know when there are vacancies on council that you're not looking at someone's race or their sexual orientation, but council did have an opportunity to have a member of the LGBTQ uh, community, and that was David Satterley, who was appointed when uh, we lost Joanne mm -hmm. um, Borders. So, um, but that's not what they look at when they're appointing for the vacancy. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Why was Downtown Inc. allowed to combine with the county? What level of control does the city have over development? 
I guess that's a two-parter. Well, um, once again, Downtown Inc. Uh, is composed of two, two branches, the uh, uh, Main Street York, or Main Street organization, um, and the BID, which is a business, uh, uh, business district, and business improvement district. Business Improvement District is, uh, again, a taxing authority. And they do levy taxes on the merchants within their uh, 26 square blocks or whatever it is. Uh, and, and once again, the, the city has, and look, council, has no jurisdiction over that. Um, the the uh, strategic alliance between the YCEA and Downtown Inc. in a broad context makes a great deal of sense in my opinion. Uh, it, it offers uh, a lot more uh, backup for Downtown Inc. in terms of personnel and, uh, and st strategic knowledge in business in, in terms of uh, gaining uh, for loans for, and, and other things of finances. Uh, for our businesses in the city. So the, uh, it's not a question of allowing it, it's a question of whether does it make sense. Uh, I think we can probably all agree that the economic development uh, portion of city government is relatively broken. And um, as a result, it has, been, it has been cut over the years. I mean, I remember when Eric Menzer was uh, the director of uh, community and economic development, and there were just tons of employees there. Uh, today, other than PPZ and the, the planning and, and that kind of thing, I mean, we're looking at economic development as one and a half people. I mean, that has been so severely cut over the course of the years that I've been on council, and we've not been able to prevent it. Uh, those of us that believe in a strong economic development uh, portion of our government where it did not have the votes to prevent the constant cutting of employees in that department. Uh, and as a result, here we are. So in, in my view, the, the best possible scenario that we have is to, to join forces with some other uh, entities that are, uh, that are uh, told or that have their, as their, um, their goal to improve the economic uh, business of the entire county. And that's the charge that the YCEA has. York City is part of that. Uh, and I would love to see closer relationships between our own economic department, our own economic development department, uh, and the YCEA in Downtown Inc. Again, it makes sense in terms of a broad picture looking downstream. What I would uh, equally like to see is a very strong community development effort where we would have some other employees beyond the, the one and a half that we have today, and have them concentrate on our neighborhoods. That's one of the reasons I ran in the first place eight and a half years ago, was that we try to improve or at least arrest the decline of our neighborhoods. That's my long-winded answer. Also, I might add that Downtown Inc.'s mission has not changed in the least. Downtown Inc.'s staff, to my knowledge, is, is still uh, the same as it was before the merger. They still have their same board. So even though the organizations have been combined, there's still a lot of uh, independence, I think, in, in the Downtown Inc. Uh, organization. Any other comment? All right. What's going on with Yorktown? We can't hear you. I can. Anyway. What's going on with Yorktown Hotel? It's slowly being demolished. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's a, I think, a, around $25 million today 
uh, project. Um, the, the back end, what we used to be that sort of stainless steel section and where the garage is, uh, that's all gonna be torn down. And in its place in the back, the main entrance to the hotel will be in the back uh, where that's located. Uh, there will obviously be street level entrances just as there always have been. Um, redoing all the rooms, reducing the number of rooms, obviously with that rear section being torn down. I think there's been some talk about having housing on some of the upper floors uh, in either condominium or rental um, and, and, and the restaurant will be redone and there will be a restaurant in there. Uh, there will not be a garage. And uh, with the proximity of the Market Street garage directly across the street, it makes a lot of sense not to invest a huge amount of money. Garages, uh, multi-story garages, are enormously expensive. And they never give a return on that investment. Never. But it will also be the Hilton? Yes. It will also be the Hilton. It will not be the Yorktown as it was before. They've partnered with Hilton, and it will be the Hilton. Mm -hmm. It'll still carry the, Hilton, the Yorktown name. But it'll be Hilton right. Yorktown. Yeah. And I, I can't give you a details in regards to the Yorktown Hotel, but I will tell you this. Um, I did shoot um, Kevin Schreiber a, te a text message because um, I was walking down Duke Street, and... Um, of course, work was being done uh, at the Yorktown, and I saw about seven men that I knew from York City working. So for me, one of my concerns have been, and I said this earlier, was that when you drive around and you see construction going on in our city, I don't see familiar faces. So about a month ago when I was walking down past Yorktown, the guys were leaving the site and I'm walking down the street and I see literally about seven guys that I know. So I, the next day I sent Kevin a text message and I said, hey Kevin, um, I wanna get together with you because I wanna know what's being done to at least see from the surface that there's some people in our community that are being employed. So I've been busy, Kevin did text me back and he said, let me know when to set up a meeting. But I'm curious to see what they're doing um, in regards to offering opportunities to folks in our communities mm -hmm. um, because that's something that's important to me. If I see construction going on, I want to see people in our communities that are benefiting economically. So to me, that's a start. It's better than what I've seen in the past. Once I get more detail, um, Definitely whoever wants to know what's going on, feel free to email me, call me, and then I can update you. Yeah, I can follow up on that as well. That um, The YCEA uh, also had a, um, um, a press conference where they, um, where they actually brought in members of the uh, York City uh, business to apply and be given favored status in applying and, and giving uh, letting of contracts. So there, there really is there an, a serious effort to have the local businesses within the city um, partake in some of this money that's being generated by the renovation of the Yorktown. Um, I mean, I was especially pleased. I think it was done at Christmas Attics, and I think there was something like 100 city businesses that were there to hear and to uh, see if it applied to them and that they could take advantage of uh, a $25 million project. Um, no disrespect, but even though we did have that event at the Christmas Annex, um, people that attended were not pleased with the outcome mm -hmm. of it, Henry. I'm sorry. I mean, you no know, disrespect, but they did not still get the input and the information that they needed to have a part of that project. I don't know why. We can follow up and find out why, but it didn't happen. Well, then that would be uh, something when you talk with Kevin. 
um, I think might be worth for you to report out at one of our city council meetings. Uh, that mm -hmm. meeting, I think that's very worthwhile for all of us. Yes. And if I can just add one more thing and reiterate what Councilwoman Judy Ritter Dixon mentioned, I share the same sentiments as well. And also, it, uh, as um, Council Vice President uh, Sandy Walker mentioned, it is great to see some of our community members working on the project. But to me, what would be even more great is to see some of our community members given the opportunity to bid on these projects and to be able to um, then provide the opportunity for other employees on these kinds of projects, these huge projects that are coming into our, coming into our community. Any further comment? Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. How are you, as the York City government, ensuring that in existing neighborhood populations are being sought for input or participation in the development of their own community? Well, there are several. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sh sh Sandy didn't hear what you said. Okay. How are you, as the city council, ensuring that the existing neighborhood populations are being sought for input, input or participation in the development of the city and in city neighborhoods? Conversation, um, mm -hmm. communication. We're not, we're very visible. And, and I say that we are in our communities. So the first thing when we're talking with folks, if there is something that they have, if there's a concern, if there's input that they have, we take it seriously. We encourage them to come to city council meetings. We encourage them to go through the chain of command and we'll follow up. Um, going door to door every now and then, but when you're in the neighborhoods and you see people and you have a very approachable persona, people come up and talk to you about stuff. So there hasn't been a time where folks that I've heard from council members that they've come to us and we have not been receptive to what they have to say or what you have to say. We're very receptive, and if we can act on it, we'll act on it, we'll, we're very honest as well. Um, and because how our administration operates, it is an administration dominant operation. Mm -hmm. So the best thing that we can do is forward it to administration and communicate those things. Um, we tell folks over and over and over, please come to our meetings. Mm -hmm. Not just city council meetings, come to the RDA meetings, come to any other committees that are present throughout the city, because if you don't come, you don't know what's going on and your voice will not be heard. That's, I'm, sometimes I'm not sure what else we can do. We can't drag people to meetings. So a lot of times when we are out in the community, that's when we hear things and we bring them back. But. If stuff wants to, if you want things done, you have got to come to these meetings and make your voice heard and get involved. So we're out in the communities, we talk to folks, um, and we want to know what's going on. Especially with the ANA, the Neighborhood Associations, mm -hmm. it is open to everyone who lives in, in their neighborhood or when they have the big meetings, they are welcome to come, and anyone like, um, Councilwoman Walker said that we've talked to, we invite them to come, be involved, get involved. I mean, it's okay to talk to us, and we do listen, but you need to come and let your voice be heard as well. Yeah, just to reinforce that, Council uh, really is an excellent conduit to pass information from, from the community and the citizens to the administration. I think that's one of our primary roles. But again, if we don't hear about it, we can't pass that information on. So one of the th perfect opportunities is the public comment session at the start of each legislative session, the two, two legislative meetings every month. Any other? I would like to add, too, that the council legislative sessions and committee meetings are on the city's website, on council's website. So I put 
links to everything you can click on. Anything that I, that's on that agenda, you're going to be able to click on that and see what it's about. So I always post the legislative agenda the Friday before council meetings, so you have an opportunity to look at it. You have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and even Tuesday during the day to see what's going on, and that's the same with the committee meetings. That's also posted online, so that's another opportunity for you to see what's going on and be able to come and speak on that before council takes action. So it's important to see that uh, because anything that council has to approve will be discussed in committee and will also be on the agenda for consideration of passage. And they do allow a discussion on that as well. So please come and let us know or let them know. I don't have anything to do with it. All right, any other comments mm -hmm. on that? No? Could you speak right in the mic? Okay, I just didn't want the going Thank on. You. Okay. Um, next question. What measures can the council and the community take to increase minority business participation in development projects such as the Yorktown Hotel? Part two, can there be a requirement to incorporate small business set-asides that use city resources? Do I need to repeat that, council? Yes. Okay. What measures can the council and the community take to increase minority business participation in the development projects such as the Yorktown? And what can you do to incorporate for small businesses to give them an opportunity in this development? Once again, uh, it's been a priority of this council announced back in January that we want to strengthen and rewrite the small, what's commonly referred to as the Smallwood uh, uh, Ordinance, uh, which is for, intended for uh, uh, small businesses and, um, you used the word and I, well, it, it, the object is minority. We had to be very careful using that word, minority, uh, for fear of uh, it, it didn't withstand a Supreme Court uh, verdict. So um, we, 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 we call it, uh, the word just escapes me right now, of the small disadvantaged, small and disadvantaged businesses, uh, which essentially would provide a leg up if you uh, are located within the city, uh, which then would, you know, give a, an extra measure of, uh, of a boost to the, uh, to the, the, small, uh, to the small business. Um, and most of those small businesses are minority owned that are in the city. So that is a priority. What, what we found out, uh, I, I talked with uh, Michael Dowry before he left uh, back in the spring, and I talked with him about how can we get this thing moving along. The, the problem is that we've got to hire a bunch of attorneys to get this thing written. It's not just our solicitor. Um, and uh, it, we're working with the state on this, and it uh, would be a cost of somewhere in the neighborhood of $50,000. Uh, we could do it in, in stages of about maybe 20, 25,000 first, and then uh, so increments later, um, but the budget can't withstand that. There is there is no money in the budget in 2018 for that. We're going to put it in, uh, hopefully for 2019, so that we can move along aggressively. This is one of our priorities of the five of us. We announced it back in January. We believe in it, and we want to pursue it, and we will pursue it. Any additional comment? Uh, the next question, which you all touched on, but just in case this person didn't hear, what is preventing the city from creating a residency requirement for fire and police? I didn't hear that. Uh, what, is the, what is preventing the city from creating a residency requirement for fire and police? Well, as we said earlier, it's contractual. Um, they were permitted to, uh, they were excused from the residency requirement years and years ago under contract. Um, that barn door was open and it will not be closed. Any other comments to that? 
I'm not being belligerent when I say that. It's simply, it's contractual. And um, the unions will never, ever agree to it because they fought and they gave up things in order to receive that excuse. I'm having a little bit of trouble reading this next question. Uh, I'll do the best I can. York City has 20% more law enforcement than cities its size. Statistically, more police don't equate to crime reduction. Why not reduce police? Redirect funds to economic development and pension deficit. I've Why never not had reduce a question, police? I've I guess never that's had a the, question like that asked yeah. about reducing police. I've always <laughs> had, why can't we have more police? Um, so it, it sort of stuns me. Uh, I think we've hit a magic number of, uh, I think it's 105 police we have, or 109, something like that. Um, I think we've hit a magic number where that works. I mean, the police department would love to have another 20 officers. Uh, the fire department would love to have another 50 uh, firefighters. Um, but, you know, at, we average out, now not, certainly not a, a beginning uh, firefighter, a beginning policeman, but if you look at the average out, when you include all the other benefits, it, we're talking about $100,000 per person, you know, per cop or per firefighter. Uh, you have 100, do the math. Uh, every time you add one, you're going to end up with a $100,000 bill in your head. I would rather see us find means of... Um, of funding economic or community development um, and, and part of community development is the uh, property maintenance inspectors that go around and, and look and, and find people that are breaking the codes and, and not painting their terrible peeling paint, uh, cars up on blocks, in their yard and a whole bunch of other things. All those quality of life issues. Um, there we can afford to hire some folks, bolster that up, make sure that weekends are covered when you've got uh, you know the weekend warriors that are out there building new things, doing this, doing that. Um, and let's, let's, let's try to clean up this city. Uh, in fact, I was just talking to Steve Buffington um, just day before yesterday about this very issue. Um, we're going to tweak this NIO, the Neighborhood Improvement Ordinance. Um, one of the things with the garbage cans being out basically 24-7, um, the way it was written, it's basically unenforceable. Uh, so we're going to tighten that up and then be able to, I want to see us have a, uh, a stronger uh, nuisance abatement. There was a lot of pushback on that because of the possibility of having uh, people that subjected to uh, domestic violence. And then the police are called and then there's a concern about, oh, are you going to rack up points against this place because of domestic violence and prevent people from calling when they're being abused. Uh, I am absolutely positive that we can write legislation that will exclude that kind of thing so that we don't uh, run the risk of having people frightened to report uh, abuse, domestic abuse. But if there are drug deals going down, if there's prostitution going on, if there's just plain neglect of housing, um, we have to do something about that. We can't, when we've got over 50% of uh, our properties are rental. We can't continue down this road of just letting uh, properties become less and less valuable. I mean, if an average city property is worth thirty-five, forty thousand dollars, $40,000, that's the price of a medium car. I mean, let's think about that. We can't, we can't continue down this path. 
So let's, let's try to clean up, and that's one of the first things. I mean, you look around, if our neighborhood, I mean, I think about the 500 block of South Duke Street where uh, Judy lives. Uh, that neighborhood association takes such pride in that block. Uh, you're not gonna, you can go down there anytime you want to and you're not gonna find trash and litter on the streets. You're gonna find pretty little flower boxes. This is not a wealthy neighborhood. This is a neighborhood that has a great deal of pride. And that, I think that's the kind of thing that you need to build. Uh, it seems the inference in that question is that with better economic development, it would lessen the need for police protection, I'm, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. That's what the question is all about. And I think the previous administration did a tremendous job with uh, economic development in the downtown core in the business district. Tremendous job, I think, and, and it's ongoing. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, we need to start doing, uh, giving a lot more thought to the economic development in our housing stock in the city. Um, improving the housing stock, uh, fostering home ownership, um, mm -hmm. pride, pride of place, and I think that would, uh, I agree with the questioner, I think that would go a long way towards uh, improving the environment and maybe lessening the need for police protection. Not too sure in regards to if um, I would be in favor of reducing our uh, police uh, officer uh, size, um, just for the simple fact that, you know, we are at full complement in a sense, but we're not at full complement in a sense. So um, when you're talking about what we're actually dealing with is usually about 20 less than what the full complement is. Um, but I would be willing to look at the statement in regards to the first part and see what other cities have, what they're doing, um, and also to see if that uh, percentage is correct um, throughout Pennsylvania with other municipalities that are similar to ours. So I'll follow up on my end in that part to, to see if that's true and then also see what they're doing with those officers um, and the amount of officers that they have. Any other comment? If I can just get a time check from you, Cliff. 716, we have a half hour left. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we have a couple of, we have a few questions to go through here. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, if you find, if you find repeats, uh, let's just move on. Okay. The revitalization of York City has been in the hands of a few white developers. What legislation do you plan to enact to mandate ethnically uh, and racially diverse participation opportunities? And that's pretty much all I can understand. What can you do to get more minorities involved in economic development? or revitalization efforts in the city. Is that the question? Who asked Is it? Is that the question? I mean, was that, yeah. I, um, let me read this again. The revitalization of York City has been in the hands of a few white developers. What legislation do you plan to enact to, um, to mandate ethnically and racially diverse participation and opportunities while arresting the monopoly of white developers in the city. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of baffled by that because if a minority business doesn't take the action to uh, redevelop, I mean, there's, there's no amount of legislation that we can say that we require uh, minority developers to come to York and develop. I mean, this is something that, you know, we personally, I would welcome anybody that wants to do any kind of development in the city. Doesn't matter whether they're white or black or Latino. That's not the issue. Um, the issue is having them actually want to develop a project. Uh, the, well, Go ahead. Is it the question that they're not getting the opportunity? Because I know I have been approached on several occasions and um, 
um, some of our constituents are saying that when they go to purchase the property, the property is already purchased by a certain developers. And I, I think that's the question is what can we do about it? We can continue to look into it and find out how that's happening and what's going on. And I have been asking questions and looking into it since it has been brought to me, and I think I can continue to work with my colleagues and find out how is that happening. Like if you want to buy a property and there may be 10 on the list and by the time you get to the list there's only two, that's a concern. And it is a concern in our community. How are these other um, companies getting these houses before the rest of the community get to look at them? And I don't have a, you know, a valid answer, but we'll continue to follow up and find out how that's happening. Well, I mean, I, I did not interpret that question that way. And uh, I mean, I certainly agree with, with Judy. I mean, that's, if, if that is actually taking place, um, that's not good at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that uh, uh, if we can investigate that, and again, report back out to the community on this. It's something that uh, I, I would be interested in understanding. Um, because if this is a matter of policy, that's bad policy. Uh, just um, to follow up, during, um, within the past year, or time starting to get me, administration did come to us with revisions for the Smallwood uh, Act or ordinance. At that time, there were so many questions and so many things being crossed out in the ordinance that it didn't move forward. Um, and so what we did as council, there were a couple of us who met with the administration and the director of economic development to go over that. There was some uh, work that was to be done with some folks from the state to help guide us with that. And then we hit the huge roadblock of the legal um, fees. So it puts things at a standstill because if you don't have the money to legally um, put forth the ordinance, there's not much that we can do except for continue to research, see what we can find. Now, what I did propose when I was on school board, um, what we did, we could not legally mandate that there be a certain amount of minority and women, at that time, minority and women owned businesses. We couldn't mandate it, it was illegal. What we put in our policy was that we had to make, we wanted to make a good faith effort and that was accepted legally. School district's completely different because the school board, we deal with the policy, city council, we deal with our ordinances, but there is a whole nother legal aspect that comes along with it. We're all on the same page when we want, we want increased minority and women business owned participation, and I know that's not the, the legal term of it, and our ordinance is small and disadvantaged businesses, but we, in the end, we want more people in our community to have opportunities at being able to put the bids in, um, and a fair opportunity. But when it comes to the legal part, it's a whole different aspect. So it's not that we don't want this to happen, it's just that legally, we have to make sure that if something is passed, that it's right, and that we don't dig ourselves in a deeper hole by passing something that is basically illegal. Um, I think the school district did a great job when it came to the schools that were remodeled, um, and the person that we hired to, to get the job done to make sure that there was a good amount of participation from our community. I think we did a, uh, the school district did a good job with that. We want to see that happen in the city. This has been on the table for a year and a half, and we keep on hitting roadblock after roadblock. So it's not something that we don't want, and we're trying to get something passed. It's just that it has been a lengthy and difficult process. I wonder if it'd be useful to just give a brief summary of what the Smallwood 
amendment or ordinance is intended to do that might clear up um, some of the confusion about the question. Basically, in a nutshell, is to give local owned businesses, minority owned businesses, disadvantaged owned businesses in our community a fair chance at being a part of economic revitalization in our community. Just to sum it up. Now, it's a very long act, and if you pull up council minutes from when it was put forth, you'll see everything that was striked out. And one of the reasons why some of the stuff was striked out is because the act is so outdated that certain things fell under economic development, certain things fell under the business department, and it was all confusing. Um, but it's to give people in our community a, ch a fair chance at putting in bids. Now, what we've pushed with YCEA is to, one of the issues that we found out was that a lot of times you have quote unquote mom and pop businesses, small businesses, who you have somebody around the corner who is great at remodeling the things, but they are not certified, they're not licensed, they don't know the process. So what YCEA offers is the training to get all those certifications because if you don't have those things, you're already at a disadvantage. You can't even come to the table. So between community development, economic development, we have folks that help with those things and then YCAA has put forth an initiative to help with the understanding, the knowledge, and the training so that you can even put, come to the table. Um, so that's what we're trying to push on our end. But when it comes to the legislation piece, we keep on hitting roadblocks. But the education is there, and we can't say it enough. You have to come to the meetings, RDA meetings, um, our blight proper, all those, those meetings, because those folks that serve on those boards vote on things. You'll find out information ahead of time. And a lot of the people who actually take advantage of if we were talking about properties, they attend meetings and they find out what properties are available and then are able to act on it. But if you don't know certain things, then you can't act on those certain things. So definitely come to the meeting so you can at least find out what's going on and see what the trainings are. Reach out to YCEA, reach out to our Department of Economic Development to see what resources are available to help you become certified to even be at the table to put in a bid. And not only just come to the meetings, um, I would like to add that get your name on the list to be appointed to the boards mm -hmm. so that you can be a part of the board so that you can help make some of those decisions as well. And you know you can go on our website, the city website, under boards and authorities and there's a description of all the different boards and authorities who serves on them, are there any vacancies, um, and what the, the, the purpose of that board and authority is. So that way you can find out something, that, oh, I've got a skill strength for one of these boards, and then do apply, because we have a terrible mm -hmm. time filling these uh, boards and authorities. Uh, we don't have the volunteers uh, coming to us, or in most cases, it's, it's the administration that does the appointments but express your desire to want to partake in one of these. And I know that, uh, I mean, if you have the skill set to serve on one of these, we would be happy for you to serve. Any further comment? Next question. What's actually being done to hire officers of color? Well, once again, we're, we're in this situation. It's not a question of not wanting to. Um, we are part of the civil service uh, process. And we have to take names as they come up. And uh, there are other, in a nutshell, the uh, surrounding police departments uh, pay better than we do and uh, the police work is not nearly as strenuous as it is here in the city. So given that combination, um, minorities are often picked 
before we can, we can get them. Um, one of the things that uh, I believe the uh, high school and HAC are talking about, and maybe they've already implemented it, is to have a program where we encourage the youth of our city to become police officers and then to serve in York City. Get some of the training through HAC. Uh, there is nothing better for a police force than to have policemen that know the community, that know who's related to who, that understand all the family histories, that can make the kinds of judgments necessary under pressure because they have a knowledge of this community from the time they were little. That makes the best cop. And uh, I think that we need to encourage that if we possibly can, um, and then move from there. Uh, this is something that has been, uh, I know Mayor Bracey and I talked about this uh, for eight years. And I talked with it with uh, uh, Chief Cayley. And it's not that the effort hasn't been made, it's just we haven't been able to succeed. I think one of the things the administration is looking into, uh, I don't know where they stand on it, but it's assigning uh, extra points for city residents that apply for these positions. But we are really tightly constricted by uh, the civil service requirements for class three cities. On top of that, to reiterate, we're really restricted when it comes to um, the civil service. Um, and it's frustrating because um, it, a lot of it's out of our control. Like even um, our chief of police doesn't even know the candidates until the names come to him. And that's how uninvolved we are restricted. Our police department is with picking the candidates according to the civil service code. So it is a very, I talked about it in the beginning, a long process. It takes almost a year. Um, now, I think the best effort, and I love what the school district is doing in regards to the partnership with HAC, is trying to educate our young people and introduce them to civil service positions at a young age. Um, the city does have the, the Youth Citizen Police Academy, which just opened up for registration. So if you have any kids that are interested in being a police officer, I would encourage you to sign them up for that. You can contact Joan Henney. Um, her email is jhenney at yorkcity.org. In addition to that, um, I think that we can really push and, and, and reiterate the process. Um, if you are a serviceman or woman, you automatically get a certain amount of points um, when it comes to the civil service code. So you get first, it's basically an advantage, as it, and as it should be, um, when it comes to being hired or being uh, put on as at least probationary for the list of names and then you have to go of course do all types of other tests that make sure that you're okay which takes up almost the whole year but if we want in my mind if we want more men and women of color to be in our police department we have to tell our young people that if they are enlisted into the military and they want to come back to York City and they're interested in that to do so. Because if you are not uh, in the military, you don't get that advantage. And so if you see, you know, you can go on White Rose Television and look at um, all of our list over the past couple years of um, a lot of our uh, police officers that were hired. And you're going to see that a good amount of them were in the military. So just becoming familiar with the process. Um, there's a partnership with, the, with our police department for making sure that, following up on reports and things like that to make sure things are, are fair with the um, YWCA. And um, one of the things that our police department was looking at doing was trying to offer assistance with training for the testing as well. So um, I think like for each person, it's a couple thousand dollars to go through all that training 
to go through. So if you know of any person or any funders that might be interested, because of course you have to go through almost six or seven months worth of testing. So to be prepared for that, one of the things that Chief Kelly and um, Chief Bankard were looking at is possibly finding private funders to help train individuals so that if there's a person who's interested in becoming a police officer in our community, going through this training, helping them train towards the test, the testing that's there, which would help give them an advantage. But military, you automatically get points, and then if you were able to be trained for the testing that occurs over that extended amount of time, that would be great. So if you know of any funders, anybody who has a couple thousand dollars who would like to help at least with one or two people in our community that might be interested, um, shoot us emails, contact Chief Bankert, and maybe we can make that initiative happen. I think it's worthy, um, it's a worthy cause. We just have to find some funding and find a couple of young men or women in our community that might be interested. Now that doesn't guarantee that they become police officers but it helps mm -hmm. in the process to make them more qualified. Any additional comments from council? Next question, what is the plan to uh, enforce the ordinance to determine the small amount of marijuana? What's the rationale? Uh, the question is that police, I believe the question is police are still charging. Um, regardless of what this ordinance intent was. I've talked to um, District Justice Thompson, no, Morgan, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> His wife is Thompson Morgan. And um, I meet with Chief Banker every month to ask him how it's going. Because, and I'm answering because I was the one that um, wrote the ordinance along with our legal team because it's very important that uh, it that they follow <coughs> the um, the rules of the ordinance however a lot of times when they go to some of the magistrates or magistrate or wherever they go they're not using it as they should and the last time that I checked with Chief Banker as to how many people um, did they arrest or how many people fell under the ordinance, it was only like one or two. So the ordinance was written to cut down on the officers having to arrest and having to incarcerate the children or grown-ups, middle-aged people, whoever, but it's not working as good as it should. I'm pretty sure some of you saw the article a while ago. Um, there was an article as a follow-up to if the ordinance was actually being enforced and the article showed that it wasn't. So we did meet with um, Chief Bankert and um, one of the issues, and it was uh, said in the article as well, is that um, the, a lot of times with ordinances, we pass them, but that's all we can do is pass them. They have to be enforced by administration. Um, so the training in regards to officers being updated about the ordinance uh, wasn't necessarily done and um, the police department was working on that piece to make sure that officers were trained and updated in regards to the ordinance. One of the issues with the ordinance is that um, it addresses small amounts of marijuana but it does not address paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. So. If you have marijuana, you might get a citation, but on the other end, you could also have paraphernalia and it could be something more serious. Um, but in addition to that as well, if there's other offenses, the um, lesser doesn't, doesn't carry. That's something I think council, at some point in time, will probably look at and compare to see what other cities that have addressed this ordinance have done. Um, but in regards to us following up, when we found out that it wasn't really being enforced, we did follow up, we did meet, and uh, we were assured that officers were being trained. So we won't be able to tell until another report comes out in regards to um, 
those uh, citations or um, charges. So take some time with those things. Any additional comment? Cliff, may I have a time check, please? This will probably be our last question of the night. Um, you wanted to wrap up at 7.45 uh, for any additional comments. Um, what is the status of the economic development contract with YCEA? I asked that before. Oops, so did that. I asked that before. I think we sort of covered that already. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see here. Okay, some of these may. Okay, we'll go with a Facebook question here. How many? Um, Okay, that you answered that as well. I'm sorry, because I'm going through these uh, as much as I can. I'm sorry. I don't think I'm going to get to your question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty long one. Um, okay, some of these. Um, all right. Uh, okay, let's go with this one. I'm sorry, folks. I'm just trying to find some that aren't kind of um, uh, repeating. Uh, a lot of businesses and nonprofits, uh, C-suite executive leadership in York does not represent the cultural makeup of the city as a whole, and often the people uh, the same or sell. Any solutions or discussions to change this pattern, especially when qualified minority professionals apply? You kind of, yeah, that's pretty much. Uh, all right, let's talk about public works. All right, regarding public works, we just got a city update from public works uh, stating turnaround time for street light repairs. Are they legislated? Are street light repairs legislated? I don't know the answer to that, um, but, I, but I doubt it. But I don't know the answer. I don't know if anybody else does. What is, you mean like, is there a legislation that you have to have street lights? Is no, repair. Repair, repair. Uh, no. Street light repairs actually go through MedEd. We have a contract with them to for street lighting. So if there's a street light that's out or, or anything is wrong with it, the light is blinking, there's an, uh, a number on the, on the pole. Sure, would you like to? Well, York City doesn't own any street lights in the city of York. Uh, mm -hmm. We will, will help to maintain them as far as having them installed. However, uh, York City doesn't regulate the street lights. If there's a repair, if there's an outage, the public works director has said over and over again what the process is to let them know that. So you contact them, you tell them the street pole name, and they'll contact MedEd and they'll have them take care of that. That's something, have you, um, I would say contact our public works director about that. Okay, well, this is not a debate. Yeah, yeah. I just okay. Since the paper came out and said it's supposed to be repaired in three weeks, is that something that came from? If you, uh, as a matter of fact, like you said, it's not a debate. Debate. There's uh, the phone numbers over there. My phone number is on there. If you send me, uh, if you call me up or send me an email, We'll talk about that, and I'll put you in touch with who you yeah, need to talk to. Yeah, and once again, I think it needs to be emphasized that this is not something that council uh, has purview on. This is part of public works, and this is part of public works and the administration's responsibilities. It is not council's. That's not the purview. You talked about your, your uh, report was going around the city and looking for structural pain and all that stuff. 
So why would grass cutting and all Well, grass cutting is included. All those things are included. And I, at the very beginning, I said, I'm not aware of any kind of uh, ordinance uh, that, that talks about uh, street lights. Can we move on to the next question? We're, we're going to move on to the next question. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, he wants to just allow opportunities for other, other, other questions, but there's other ways that you can reach counsel besides right here, okay? That's not true. But how does the process work as far as trash and rubbish being removed from our neighborhood? What is the time frame for removal? Recommendations make landlords more responsible for their property. Well, wouldn't that just be wonderful? <laughs> I think we would all dream about that. Um, again, it's a question of enforcement of the Neighborhood Improvement Ordinance. As I said just earlier that I spoke with uh, Steve Buffington, who's head of PPC, that uh, this is not being enforced. Uh, I understand that this is a terrible job for the PMIs. Um, I have fought over the course of the last eight years to increase the number of PMIs. That has finally happened, uh, and I hope that uh, this new administration doesn't go around to trying to cut some of those employees. The, uh, my, my real concern is why aren't these uh, ordinances being enforced. Mm -hmm. Not only are they not being enforced, but I find out, at least last February, when I started to talk about this, that $43,000 in fines have been issued in Fe by February, so I suspect it's much greater today. And 13000 has been collected. So I see the beginning here of a situation just like the sewer and refuse issues where all of a sudden over decades and decades we have millions of dollars outstanding to the city. And this is, it, it, somehow it started, you know, at twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 owing uh, and then it increases. Uh, and we're not going after it. And this to me is part of the responsibility of the administration. This is not something that council has in here. We enacted the legislation and it goes to the administration for enforcement. Pure and simple, it is not being enforced. Go to the mayor, go to the, the different department heads, and let's get this thing done. I would like to just ask this last question. And uh, uh, time check, Cliff? Okay, last, qu that last question. Okay, the city has an apparent and obvious issues with discrimination in the areas of protected classes, uh, especially race and disability, and particularly in employment. Uh, the commission is now located outside the city. And so this resident would like to know what is the council's feeling or uh, any actions that you may be taking to bring the HRC back into the city and in, instead of and hiring an executive director, um, there's also an investigator position that's still open and uh, returning it to the city so that residents can have a place downtown or somewhere here in the city where they can have their complaints investigated uh, because right now they're sending complaints to the state. Is there anything that council can comment on? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, the, the uh, HRC exists today. So uh, anything that comes from the city, any kind of a complaint within city boundaries goes to the HRC for investigation. It does not go necessarily to the state. Uh, we have provisions for that. So if it's coming from somewhere outside of the city, then yes, it goes to the state because we have no purview there either. The, uh, the location of where the office is, uh, is about two blocks just outside the city limits in West York. So it's really not outside the city. I mean, it's within 
uh, walking distance of most anywhere in the city. Uh, we found a place, we were kicked out of the, uh, the courthouse, and we finally found a place that, that we could go to. Uh, and uh, West York was kind enough to, to offer us that, uh, their space. Um, I, I have no knowledge that the HRC is not performing as it should be um, because it is located just outside of the city. Uh, if there is information to that, uh, then I certainly would like to hear about it. I think any of us on council would like to hear about it. Um, it's not an ideal situation. It would be wonderful to have it right, uh, right close to Center City. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have the funds to rent a space outside or in the, within the city, and there isn't any more space left in, uh, in City Hall. If anybody else would like to comment on that. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, it's the issue of um, not having an executive director and an investigator as to why these cases are being sent up to the state. Yeah, because there are not, there's two positions that are open now. So there's no one there to address any complaints that come in. So they're sending them to the state. But that wouldn't be the council. That would be the administration. Yeah, the administration appoints people to the HRC. So if they're not paying attention to that, um, that, that once again, talk to your mayor. And I know that the investigator position is open, so that's uh, on the city website if anybody is interested in applying for that. The qualifications are on there, so feel free. Right. Council, okay. that's all the time. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have a, a question from Facebook. Um, the question is, wouldn't it make sense to disassociate from the consortium because it doesn't benefit or help York City achieve our goal of increased minority officers? That has been discussed, uh, and the, the consortium being the civil service. Um, and I don't know what the answers are to that. I don't know what the, uh, um, the problems would be if we were to, to leave that, uh, that consortium. Um, so again, that's something that's up for discussion as far as I'm concerned. Um, the end goal needs to be qualified policemen uh, and, and hopefully have the uh, police force reflect the, uh, the ethnicity of our city. Okay, that's it for the questions this evening, Council. Well, I just want to close. Um, there, there have been a, a number of concerns and brought up in the past. There have been a number of concerns brought up at uh, our Council meetings concerning um, the, the revitalization and apartments in, in the city. Um, and, I, and, and I don't want to use, the, I hate to use the word gentrification, uh, but that has been the, uh, the concern, I think, on the part of a number of people. I, just, uh, I did some research on this, and I just want to share this with uh, the group here and with anybody watching. Over the course of the last uh, eight years, there have been 67 uh, affordable housing units created. If, uh, when, when the Penrose uh, development, which is on the Danskin property out by the Good School, when that is completed in the next year, year and a half, uh, that'll add another 56 units for a total of 123 units over the past decade of affordable housing. Um, we've had come online in, in the last, uh, say, eight years or so, in the development downtown, uh, I think the number is around 165 uh, units that are at market rate. However, a number of these last properties, uh, the H&R Block building as an example, the Woolworth building, Wine Room building, um, and I believe at least one other, um, has as a component 20% of those units 
must be affordable housing. So we are, and I should not we, it's the developers that are using these tax credits and they are um, being required to have affordable housing as part of the complex. Beyond that, the, out of the 165 units, we're looking at places that were completely empty. Color Works, the, uh, the old Bears building, which is now Market Way 1, the J.E. Baker building, uh, all those, uh, the Elm Terrace, all these buildings were empty. We, no one was displaced. So I fear, along with any of these folks that have expressed concern about it, that, you know, I don't want us to see us go down the road where we have housing stock only for the people who can afford market rate. Uh, and and I am willing to look at what we can what we can do to make sure that affordable housing and mixed use housing is part of what we do. I love the uh, the, the recent developments that have are required to have uh, affordable housing as part of their their development. Um, this is really a valuable thing that uh, that that we can that we can have. So. Thank you all. Thank you to my colleagues for giving up an evening. I hope that you walk away from tonight knowing that we are concerned, uh, we want to listen, and we want to hear from you. So good night, and thank you again for being here.